Good morning. Nobody's over there. Good. I don't teach to that half, so I'm not as nice as the other teachers. It's good to see you. Let's get started. We're going to begin by reading Acts chapter 16, um, starting in verse 16, Acts 16, verse 16. I was reflecting as I um, was preparing this lesson, I I was thinking maybe the Lord has got prison in my future, whether maybe a prison ministry or a prison itself, because I seem to be constantly getting all the prison passages in this uh, walk through Acts. So we'll we'll see if there's any meaning behind that or if it was truly just random. So let's read this and then we'll pray. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with this his entire household that he had believed in God. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the rain. Um, We thank you for the breath that we have in our lungs to be able to serve and worship you. Um, I pray that this passage will speak to us. It um, is not possible without the Spirit of God to speak through me and to speak to the hearts of those that hear today. And so I ask humbly that that would be your will and that be your, that, that be your, um, your action this morning. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So a little background here, um, this slave girl that we read about is she um, is um, exercised, essentially. What we get some insight into from just history is that she had what um, the Greek here shows that she had the spirit of a python, 
Um, and that, that was a Pythonic spirit, which tells us that she was a priestess of Apollo. Um, and so if you know anything about the Greek gods, um, that is uh, Apollo was the deity who was associated with giving oracles. And so she was a priestess of that, um, that Apollo. Now, the key thing to recognize is that um, fortune telling was, was not a fringe thing. So in our culture, we don't really um, do a whole lot of fortune telling. You know, you don't go to the fortune teller. Maybe, maybe you know, hopefully none of it, nobody in this room's doing that. It's necromancy. It's wicked. But um, don't do fortune telling. Um, probably the most socially acceptable way what I'm getting to is the... Um, the, the horoscope in the newspaper as fortune telling. We don't want to read the horoscope. Um, that's, that's no bueno either. Um, but it, that's, that's socially acceptable. Maybe if you're at a, a carnival, you might go to the, the gal in the tent, you know, and that's kind of socially acceptable. Still wicked. Don't get me wrong. I'm, just because it's socially acceptable doesn't mean it's not wicked. Um, and so don't do those things. But beyond that, like, you know, when you're making a major life decision, um, you're not you're not going to the fortune teller, right? You don't see that as a common practice in our society. It's not really not really acceptable socially to do. But in Roman society, it was. And so even in high society, they would not have considered or thought in any way, shape or form about making a major life decision, a general would not have gone to war without going to seek the soothsayer, the fortune teller, and say, hey, how is this going to turn out for us? And so they were very superstitious in that respect. They, they, they served a polytheistic um, uh, pantheon of gods. And so that's, that's the culture. And so when they say that this young lady who had this spirit of divination, when Luke says that, and it made these men a lot of money, no, this was a lot of money. Like this, what this wasn't some you know some little hoax. You know, they they these were wealthy men, um, and and they owned this girl. She was a slave to them, um, and so that's a little bit of the cultural background. So it would it would have been very socially acceptable for lots of people to visit, um, and I guess maybe a, pot, a somewhat corollary would be playing the lottery, which I don't think you should do either. There's better things to do with your money. So, but I won't be as firm on that one as. Um, the wickedness of, uh, of uh, fortune telling. So I have a question for you. Hopefully this is a softball that gets you warmed up this morning. What is this demon-possessed girl saying? Read it out of your passage. What is she saying? Think, look at the specific words that she says. It's there in verse 17. They're bond servants. Of who? The most high God. And what do they bring? Salvation. salvation. They bring the way of salvation. Now, is this truthful? It's truthful, but she's actually mocking them. It's, what was that, Gary? She's actually mocking them. She's mocking them. It's a true statement. It's, yeah, it's a true statement, but you say she's mocking them. Why is that? Because she's the devil. She's the devil. She has the devil filled with her for sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes, it is truthful, but she's mocking them. She's, she's speaking from the power of a spirit if she says that. Now, that's interesting, so let's unpack that a little. So she um, is saying they're the servants of the Most High God. They're the servants of the Most High God. That is certainly true. But we have to look at the genericity of what she's saying as well. Because we have, this will help us understand why does Paul get so frustrated with her and, and turn around and say, hey, come out of her. Um, because as a younger man, I'd always was confusing to me. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'd be like, well, he seemed like he's saying good things about him. Like, you know, they were like drawing attention to you. So why would you, why would you do that? It did, it's never made sense to me. But when she says that they are serving some God most high, that could refer to the supremacy of Paul's gods above all others, for sure, which is true. God's, or Paul's God, the God of the Bible, is supreme above all others. But it was more likely a generic term. And so it would be a lot like just using the word God um, in our language. And so when we say God, in this context, in this building, we generally have a full understanding that we are speaking of the God of the Bible. But if I say God at work, it's a little different, right? Because in our culture, 
there are so many different gods, right? There's the God of the Muslims, which is not the same God that we serve. Don't, don't get confused on that. Betty? Yeah, the spirit has an evil intent, has a has a has a, a purpose about doing what what they're doing. Absolutely, um, and I think it kind of can play. And I would agree with you, but I guess I think it kind of plays into the fact that there's just this generic term of God, and they also use as a very generic term of salvation, right? They just they bring. In fact, the Greek could easily it says the way of salvation here. Um, and it's not necessarily a definite article, meaning like the one and only way of salvation. That's not exactly what there she's saying there. It's probably more like a way of salvation. And so it's this idea of the, this culture that they're in is a polytheistic. There's a pantheon of gods. Here are, here are them. They, you know, the Jews would have said the same thing, the, the same phrasing for their God, um, who is, yes, the same God. But you, I think you see where I'm going. Who are they not? Who is she not proclaiming? Who? Jesus. Jesus. She's not proclaiming Jesus. And so that's what you see Paul do through this passage, right? That's what you see Paul do throughout the scripture. And so I think that's really important to understand that foundationally as we try to interpret this passage. Because, and, and, and even then, as we speak outside of these walls about the God of the Bible, I think it's far better to mention the name Jesus Christ, and that's the pattern that I see in Scripture, than it is to necessarily mention God. And, and you probably know that because it's a lot safer to mention God in a religious conversation at work than it is to mention Jesus Christ. Because as soon as you start mentioning the name, what happens? They turn you off? Yeah. What else happens as soon as we mention the name of Jesus in a conversation in our culture? Kelly? I'm wondering if there isn't instant division, because when you said that about God, I'm thinking a lot of religions would be okay with God. Uh, mm -hmm. Mormons, Muslims, they might be okay with that because they interpret that as whatever they, is their deity. But Jesus Christ is a little maybe bit more particular, yes. divisive. When you say particular, I think the word exclusive. Okay. So Christ taught an exclusive faith. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Betty? I find that people that are from different cultures that I've worked with, it's important for them to say that, well, we serve the same God. Mm -hmm. So they want to hear God. They don't want you to say Jesus. They don't want you to say Jesus at all. Yeah. Because then somehow they perceive that as you thinking that you are above them. Yes. But as long as you say God, they're all content with it. They were happy. Okay, we serve the same God. Yeah. I work with Hindus and Muslims in the school system. And as long as you say God, yeah. you're fine. You're good, you're good. But as soon as we mention Christ, mm -hmm. that's when that exclusivity comes up. And that's when things will get a little lively. And that's okay. If you want to have that conversation, don't, don't back out of it at that point. But recognize maybe the most helpful way to communicate the truth about the God of the Bible. And, you, and, and Betty, you, know, you mentioned it too, Muslims. We don't serve the same God as Muslims. It's not the same God of Abraham. The Muslims serve a monotheistic God. There's God the Father. That's it. Who do we serve when we say God? The triune God. The triune God, very good. Bill, right? Very good, Bill. We serve the triune God. We serve God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when you bring Jesus Christ in, you're bringing God the Son in of the triune God that we serve and recognize that when we say God, theologically, we mean something 100% different than the rest of the world around you. And that's why I think Paul gets frustrated with this situation. And he says, out from among her, come out, because she's confusing the situation. She's not saying the same thing Paul's trying to say when he's in Philippi and trying to establish this church. And he's going around preaching, he's saying these things, 
And I think this demon-possessed girl certainly represents entrapped people by all means, but in the context of, of the meaning of this passage, I see that she's representing primarily the kingdom of darkness. And this kingdom of darkness is following after Paul. He's following after Silas as they are trying to do the work of the kingdom of righteousness, the kingdom of heaven. And Paul just has enough. And so he says, out from among her. But we also recognize what does he say in verse 18 now when he performs the exorcism. What does he say? What's, what's very important about that verse 18 and what he says? In the name of Jesus Christ, come out from among her. So does Paul do this of his own power? No. Paul does this from the power of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing I want all of you to hear and see is that when you see the word of God speaking about the way of salvation, the way of salvation with a definite article, it always mentions the name of Jesus always mentions the name of Jesus. When you're sharing the gospel with people, mention the name of Jesus because there is power in that name. There's power in that name. And you will see that power activate when you use the word Jesus in those conversations. I promise you, if, if it's not something you've been doing, just give it a go, right? I warn you, <laughs> it, it'll, it'll make the conversation a lot more lively. But do it, because that's where the power um, of salvation is. In Acts 4.12, Peter says this, to, and Peter and John say this when they're before the Sanhedrin after healing the, the lame man in front of the temple, where he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so, sorry for the King James, that's where I memorized it, so I wrote it down here that way. Um, but the... Uh, that's the truth. We, we, we have the name of Jesus. We have salvation in no other name. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And that's the truth that people need to hear. That's the truth that people need to hear. Your salvation, the way you speak about salvation to your neighbors, to your coworkers, can't just be your way. Right? This was, this was a conversation with me decades ago I had with, um, with a coworker where they responded, oh, that's okay, that's the way you think it is, and that's fine, and I can believe my way, and that's fine too. Um, they're, they're both okay, they're both right. And it was, I was somewhat okay with letting they are both okay, because now we're into kind of like a political, um, even my ecclesiology, that I don't want to force anyone to the church. I want it to be a voluntary decision, right? But when you say they're both right, I can't, I couldn't let that one go. And I said, no, no, actually, that's not what I'm saying. I, you got to be really, you got to be really clear what I'm saying is that this is the only way. People that don't put their faith and trust in Christ will unfortunately spend an eternity in hell. And that was a huge stumbling block. That individual did not like me from that, from that time forward um, and was offended. Hopefully, I mean, maybe they were offended by how I approached it. I hope not, but they were certainly offended by the gospel and the truth. We've got to make sure the truth is clear because it is that truth of God's word that actually saves people. That's going to come into play later in this passage. So moving on. Now, once this exorcism happens, um, we get into verse 19, and we see right off the bat, um, I think we see um, two things, um, or sorry, three things I wrote down here about different types of worship that we see earthly forms of worship, worship in which causes this, um, this ruckus to happen and for Paul and Silas to be beaten and thrown in prison. So the first one I see is a worship of money. Um, I think that one's obvious, kind of steps right out of the page, verse 19. Um, it's interesting in the Greek, the, there is a play on words here as I was reading through commentaries on this. There's a play on words, the same word for the spirit coming out of the woman. Um, the slave girl is the same word for that their hope of gain was gone. The, 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 the money came out of the men in the same way that the spirit came out of the woman. Like that's Luke is making a play on words there. I thought that was an interesting um, word, word component. I'm not a Greek scholar, but that, I take that for what it's worth. Run with it. Um, so, so, but 
I thought that was interesting because it's like, okay, yeah, that what came out of these men, their wealth. And so back to what I said at the beginning, if you weren't in the room, there's a few more people in here, but um, fortune telling, you know, is kind of like a fringe thing. It's almost not socially acceptable in our society. Um, again, just a repeat for those that are in here, don't read the horoscope. Don't go to the little gal in the tent at, this, at the carnival. Those are wickedness. That's necromancy. We don't want to do those things. So, but for the most part, like that's practically the only like ways I could think fortune telling was considered acceptable in our society. Um, but, uh, but um, in Roman society, again, this is something everyone did. I mean, even the generals would go to these people and find out if a, if a battle was going to work well. And so they were really rich. That's the point there. So they're really, really rich. And now they don't have the ability to do this. If the scowl doesn't have the ability. They don't have their money. They saw this as an attack on their property because they owned this girl. And so that's that's their perspective. And so they just basically, Paul, it's Paul just destroyed their property. It was like, it was almost the equivalent of just running in and, and, and throwing all of the China dishes in a China shop at a business, right? You know, that, that was kind of what happened here. And so um, she was a gold mine to these men, and you can see that they worship money. But then when you get into verse 20 and 22, 20 to 21, really, um, the way they respond is not, when they go to the magistrates, they don't go, hey, these guys just destroyed all of our profitability, right? Can we throw them in prison? So maybe that wouldn't have been acceptable, I don't know, but read verse 20 and 21, and, and let's, let's have a conversation about that. What do we see there was the two reasons, there's two that I saw, that they worship. They appealed to the worship of culture in two ways, as to why these men are bad and we should throw them in prison. What do you see? The Romans, what? They're going against Roman law. They're going against Roman law, right? So he's making a political argument, right? He's making a political argument saying, hey, these guys, they're breaking some law. Um, they're sharing the gospel, and that's, that's wrong. Now, I did, um, in my research, do some commentaries. Scholarship basically doesn't necessarily identify that there were any particular laws on the books. They didn't come around until the second century, but um, that did forbid sharing the gospel. But um, he makes the appeal nonetheless. We have it here in the Word, so I can't, I'm just saying I can't come up with any history component there for you, but what else do you see? Yeah? They're disturbing the peace. They're disturbing the peace. Why is that a problem in Rome? <laughs> yeah, they prided themselves on that, absolutely. In, in fact, when, whenever there was those, you know, ruckuses and they had the big rebellions and whatnot, Rome was not kind to those. They, they'd come in with the whole army and, and put it down. All the magistrates would lose their job. So now the magistrates' economic security is at stake too, right? They're, they're going to lose their job if they don't put this, this down. What else can you see? Yeah, Terry. Well, there's something in the fact that they say these are Jews and they're disturbing the Yeah, and they're advocating customs. They're advocating customs. And so the way I see it is like that's kind of a, they're worshiping their false gods. So what is the Roman customs? Well, the Roman custom is, again, worshiping a pantheistic, um, a, a pantheon of gods. They're polytheistic in their, in their religion. It's either the Roman gods or the Greek gods. One of the two is going to be the, the, the religion, the vogue of the day, right? And so that's what they're, that's what they, they're doing. And so they're, they're coming in and saying, hey, um, these guys um, are, are simply not going to work for us because they are coming in and they are advocating their own form of superstition. They, 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 they came and they preached against our form of superstition. They, they, they did some, you know, magic that just basically caused this spirit to come out of my prophet center, this slave girl, and they're infuriated. And so they, they now appeal to the culture's breadth and say, we have these false gods that we worship, and they're teaching against those false gods. They're Jews, so there's potentially some ethnic you know, component that's coming into play here. Um, and then they're also appealing to just the, 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 the political nature of it. And so they know that if they can get the magistrates to see that there's this big, you know, riot that's about to happen, the magistrates are going to come in really hard and shut it down. Do you have something, Terry? Well, the Romans also um, advocated that Caesar was a god. 
Yeah. So they were, they were pushing some other God to worship. They were trying to cause division. Yeah. Absolutely. So the Caesars would claim themselves to be God as well. And so that even kind of can tie into the to the words that the, the slave girl was saying. Absolutely. And so um, so even though that there was this just loss of economic capability, these slave owners are manipulating the situation as best as they can. They're master manipulators. You can just see it coming through here. So then, of course, they, they, the crowd does join and tax them. The magistrates um, have them beaten, um, and then they throw them in prison. And so before we move on, though, in what other ways? So let's talk about how we see this same type of pattern. Because you see a pattern. Hopefully that conversation helped us see a pattern. So I want to have a conversation. What kind of pattern in our culture today do we see where our culture gets really riled up when we speak that same truth of God's word in our cultural context. Gary? Well, you added more there than what originally I was going to address. The Romans prided themselves on their version of law. Yes. So there's no, due, there's no due process that occurs here. So it's an example for us, I think, of the failure to truly investigate all, and they didn't do it, and they ended up being horribly embarrassed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here he's saying the Romans prided themselves on their version of law and order. They absolutely did. And that will come into play later when we see the magistrates come and apologize. And, um, but absolutely. And so they didn't do due process here. So. Yeah. Yes. It's how, how, so how is history repeating itself? Phil. Well, you've already emphasized the exclusionary aspects. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the Romans were more than willing to allow you to add Add deities as long as you didn't take away from theirs. Mm -hmm. and kind of act like you know, you've got the corner of the market. And, and we see that in our culture today as well. Obviously, Christ is the only way. Yeah. That's, that's where the division is. Absolutely. And that, I personally um, was requested to take my Bible verse off my signature at work at the University of Nebraska. Yeah. Because of a outside community member that's a Yeah. And it was just, it was like a, a woman that talks about living in peace and, and I can't I, I'm not really him right, but very generic, very what we want everybody to do. Shouldn't have been anybody as it was from the Bible. Yeah. Was, did you, curious, did you uh, have the reference in there as well? Or was it just oh, yeah. the verse? You had the reference? Okay. It'd be interesting to see if that same thing happened if all you had was the verse. Well, I, so. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I, got, I got a, a quote from uh, Martin Luther King, and okay. he referenced a Bible verse, and I, I can't quote the Bible verse. So, <laughs> there, the you, made, you, the Bible verse, I put the whole thing in there. We'll I love it. <laughs> so you basically quote Martin Luther, who's quoting the Bible. <laughs> very good, very good. I, I'm going to learn from that. So <laughs> I saw a hand over here. Was it Jess or Stephanie? Somebody, no, you guys are okay. okay. Patty? We saw it in 2020 when with, um, the A group and the alphabet people, street uh, preachers were getting beat up for saying that preaching the word of God or maybe Jesus. So we, we've already seen this happen, and this is Pride Month, so it didn't happen to be that. Yeah, so when we speak out against the LGBTQT community, um, and we say hey, that, you know, God is God is God. And, and by the way, I was reading a doctrinal statement from a church. Um, don't worry, I, there's nothing to be connected with my membership here. Um, it was somebody else I knew. They were going to a church. I'm like, hey, I wanted to see what the church was. And, it was, and, and I love the way that the church wrote their doctrinal statement where they said, um, we see it as good to be created by God as male and female and that that is immutable. And, and I thought that was a really good way of putting that. But when we speak that truth, we're, we're speaking that in love because uh, hopefully we are. We should always speak the truth in love. 
Um, I want people to know that God created them male and female because I'm convinced in my own heart that that is what is best for them. They were created in the image of a triune God and that they were created where they are most fulfilled when they live a life that glorifies that God. And the, and the way of salvation through Jesus Christ is how they're going to be reconciled to that purpose and task. But when I say, no, you can't identify and choose your own sex, boy, does that get them riled up. Absolutely, because I am taking away their autonomy, which is the root of rebellion against God in sin, is that we want autonomy to live lives our own way. John helps us um, through faithful preaching. He, say, he says that frequently. What else do you see? What gets our culture riled up when we speak the truth of God? The fact that there's rules. The fact that there's rules. Okay. God designed marital acts to be done after marriage, people get mad because they can't live the life they want to. Yeah, yeah and, they, and we're just this out-of-touch yes. um, community that just doesn't understand how culture has changed and we need to have the Bible change with the, with the culture. Um, Steve? Some things I came up with, um, oftentimes we might have to address matters of integrity with people, which um, hits their livelihood. And so you might be in a business meeting where the meeting is saying, well, let's just lie about this. And you have to stand up and say, no, we can't do that. And people will get riled up because now that hits the profit line of the, of the company. Um, sex education in schools. Don't presume that you know more than me about education. So when we've tried to advocate for proper sex education in schools, that's oftentimes the response you get from a school board. Um, maybe, maybe your view on creation has you seeing the earth as being created very um, young ago, and only a fool would believe such things. Um, it's one of the things that I feel like I've run into, abortion, um, my body, my choice. How dare you tell me what I'm allowed to do with my body. Um, pornography. Um, many people just see this as feeding my body what it needs. It's no different than eating food when I'm hungry. Um, and being able to speak truth about the wickedness of the sexual sin. And so, um, some other things that I thought, so great. So, let's move on, verse 25 now. Um, about midnight, Paul and Silas are praying. And they're singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was this great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking, shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So we're going to park on Paul and Silas's response. So they just got beaten. Their feet are fastened in the stocks, as it says there in verse 24, um, which means that they're lying down on their ground, on the cold, damp floor of this prison, um, this was not, you know, two cots in a hot kind of a scenario. Um, and so, um, or a cot and two hots, whatever that one is. I, don't, I said that wrong, didn't I? Yeah, okay, that's why you guys were laughing. Um, so, um, but um, they're, not, they're not lying down on a cot. They've got, they're on a, a cold, damp floor. They, they can't move because their feet are anchored in the stocks. Um, and, um, and so they're not comfortable right? They have been beaten, and so they are lying down on a dirt floor on open wounds. So th this is what's going on with Paul and Silas. Now, how would you respond in that kind of a scenario? Just curious. Be honest. Be honest with me. How would you, how would you think that you might be tempted to respond? Maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll give you a little safety net there. Whoa, is me. Woe is me. Absolutely. That's what I'm thinking. All right, come on. I don't see myself singing and praising and saying hymns um, and praying. I just don't, I don't know that I'm that sanctified. Maybe I hope I would, 
But <laughs> I mean, I've read this story, so I kind of hope I would go through that. But you know, a lot of times when I've suffered, that's not been my response. I've had maybe more of a sinful, fleshly response, a woe is me type of response. Um, you know, and and I'm, you know, and even if they weren't singing and praising and praying and in doing what they were doing, you know, if they if they were just simply they're licking their wounds per se, I'm not sure I would necessarily judge them for that. I mean, it seems like they went through quite a, a horrific experience there. Um, that's never happened to me. The most I've ever had was been told to shut up. Like that's that's my level of persecution. So, I mean, what can I complain about here? But um, so. I love, though, to see how Paul and Silas respond. They teach us. They teach us. They are not going through a pleasant time. But what is it that their response is? They are praying and singing hymns to God, and they're doing so loudly so that the other prisoners are listening to them. I don't think this was like a large prison or anything. This is probably, a, you know, you, you can actually go see second century Philippi on Google Maps. If you, if you Google, um, just go, go to Google Maps and search for old, old Philippi, and you know, it'll take you to all the ruins. But it, these were really small buildings is what I'm getting to. So they weren't like in some big, you know, you know mega prison that we have today in our culture. But they're, they're just sip, they're saying they're praying and they're singing and praising and praying hymns. And I think that teaches us because so many times in our lives, what is our response when we go through hard time? Woe is me. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. Right? Don't get me wrong. I understand that when we go through hard times, it hurts. We grieve. And there is an important process for that. And I've spoken about that elsewhere. But I do think that there is merit in those moments for us to be praising our God. That, that we can, in the midst of joy and sorrow and in the midst of grieving, have great joy and be thanking our God for what he is allowing to come into our lives. Because instead of what? Blaming. Instead of blaming him, absolutely. That could, be the, that could be kind of a worst case scenario that we go to rather than just maybe a complaining or a grumbling spirit. You're going to say something, Stephanie? I was going to say there's something about it being out loud that they mm-hmm. were listening to. They weren't quietly contemplating the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. So that they could be encouraged with one another, and then there's people that were also listening to them. There's something to be said about that aspect in suffering. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you heard somebody say that, because I've oftentimes wondered, like, why is it that I learn or retain things more when I hear myself speak as opposed to just let it stay up in my head? But, Terry? Yeah, you know, it's just like that. I think I would go back over it over and over and over and over, blaming myself. How can I do that? I mm-hmm. am wrong. How can I do that better? And forget that it's all in the hands of God. And I tend to forget that God is in control, even in those things. Yeah, that's a great perspective. A lot of times we, we, we beat ourselves up thinking that we've done something wrong when the reality may be that, and that's what I think we see happening here. There is a sovereign God at play in this story. And so God is sovereignly at work. And I also, and, that, and so thank you for drawing my segue out there, uh, Terry. But absolutely, I think Paul and Silas just take this on the chin. And it's because of their confidence in the sovereignty of God. And so they, they see this and they're just like, hey, we know God is in control. God is at work in something in this process. And so let's praise him. Let's praise him. Jordan? Yeah. Like, what a perfect picture of that. Hey, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan saying he had every cause to grumble and dispute, and you quoted, do all things without grumbling or dis- um, dis- disputing. What's the reference of that again? Philippians 2.14. Philippians 2.14. Kelly? I was thinking that potentially they're saying it out loud to convince to convict their own hearts as mm-hmm. well. So there's definitely an element about saying things out loud, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So yeah. there's they're increasing their own faith. So potentially they didn't get land on that floor and immediately go, Oh, I'm so happy. Mm-hmm. Potentially they had to say to themselves, This is not the greatest place I've ever been in, but I know this to be true. I know this to be true. And they're saying it to themselves. 
themselves in each other to convince their own hearts as well. And Amen. then we get the benefit of it. Amen. And whatever it was that they did, whatever it was that they said, whatever it was that they sang, it ultimately impressed the jailer. Because when he saw Paul and the other prisoners did not escape, for whatever reasons that, that all happened in this passage, um, this jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so he, perhaps it was that he'd heard the preaching before the arrest. Perhaps it was the endurance of the suffering during their arrest that he witnessed. Perhaps it was their demeanor in jail. Perhaps it was their unwillingness to flee. Perhaps it was the reducing to rubble all the moments that the jailer had done. Um, sorry, perhaps it was the reducing to rubble in moments all the jailer had done to secure these prisoners. Or it was probably the accumulation of all those things. He comes and says, what must I do to be saved? And so it spoke to the jailer. And then we see there in verse 31, we see Paul's response again back to the name of Jesus. What does he say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then in verse 32, it says, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And so they then had the opportunity at that point to share the gospel. And they walked through the word of God with the jailer and with his whole household. And by God's grace, we then see an amazing thing happen. The entirety of the um, jailer's household comes to a saving faith in Christ and are baptized. And so the jailer believes, the household believes. Um, then they were baptized. And then we see something I think that is beautiful. Because what happens, look in verse 33. What happens? What does the jailer do for Paul and Silas? He washed their wounds. He washed their wounds. What else does he do for them? He went. Well, Paul and Silas baptized them. So yeah, that's a beautiful thing, right? So he washes their wounds. And then Paul and Silas, in a sense, wash them of the, of, you know, the, the symbolic washing that baptism is of sins. What else does the jailer do for them? He treated them as guests. He yes. Them. He invites them into his home. He feeds them, right? Um, he invites them into his home and he feeds them. Why is that beautiful? Mm. Countercultural? Very good. Yeah, that is beautiful. That's beautiful. Countercultural, but what I find to be most, that's not wrong, but what I find to be most beautiful is this Christian fellowship that happens. It's like the jailer and his household believe, and then what happens? There is love. There is love displayed on both sides, right? And now you've got this body of Christ, this little genesis of a body of Christ that's starting. Oh, Lydia's already in, right? But and there's some others I'm sure that have already that have already joined. But now there's a, a greater core of this Christian church that is being established in Philippi. And so um, I always think in this moment, the gospel comes with a house key, a great book, Rosaria Butterfield. I um, encourage you all to read it. But the, the primary thesis of her book is that we need to serve and service and hospitality requires sacrifice and it's joyful. And so, and, and one of the key things she will oftentimes say throughout the book is that that requires us to make capacity in our lives to do these things. And so you see so much of, I think, what Rosaria writes about in, in, that, in that book, um, but it stands so much in contrast to this uh, slave girl's owners who were concerned about money, and then they had this jailer who first supported it, imprisons them, and they beat them, they mistreat them, they don't even give them due process. Like, everything is all amiss in this passage until Jesus enters the picture, saves the jailer and his household, and now we have fellowship. And now we have fellowship. And we have fellowship across cultural boundaries. We have fellowship across animosity. Like Paul and Silas were just beaten by these guys, right? <laughs> like that's hard, right? When you're mistreated by someone, boy, that really, that's where the gospel gets radical. 
It's when you get mistreated by somebody and then you invite them over and you feed them, right? That's the radical nature of the gospel. And so um, after salvation, the jailer is generous and he gives freely. Um, and so I see hospitality um, in this passage and I see that hospitality is a confirmation of works that this jailer is truly saved. And then he praises God. He then praises God, verse 34. He, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. And so ultimately throughout this passage, what we see here is that the divine power that removed the demon from this girl also delivered Paul and Silas from the crowd and saved this man and his family from their sins. It is the same divine power working throughout the entire thread of the whole passage, that divine power of Jesus, the divine power of Jesus. So some other passages of scripture, just to kind of reinforce this point, to let it rest in your heart and in your mind as you leave the day. Second Corinthians chapter five, you can flip to these if you want. I'm going to go pretty quick though. Second Corinthians five, verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, make God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him who to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. And that's what we see happening in this passage. A man who was lost in sin, being reconciled not only to God, but then also being reconciled to others. And it's the beautiful picture of salvation that we see play out time and time again in Scripture. And hopefully the beautiful picture of salvation that you've seen play out time and time again in your life. And... Um, and those who were at once war with each other have been reconciled. Take a, you can flip to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Again, see this play out time and time again in Scripture. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So what do we see is the reality of Christian fellowship is that we come from a massive diversity of backgrounds, whether that's socioeconomic, whether that's ethnic, whether that's, um, whether that's education, whether that's how our parents raised us. Some had bad parents, some had good parents. All of that stuff influences the kind of human being that you are. And we all know that, but in Christ, we can be one body. In Christ, we can be one body. And what does it require of you for that to work, that list of things, holy, you're holy and beloved, but put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if you have a complaint, you forgive the other as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. If we want the peace of Christ, as we see happening in this passage in, um, in Acts 16, to be a reality in our lives, that's what we need to pursue because that's, that's how that works. The peace of Christ will when we allow the radical nature of the gospel to do these things. The radical nature of the gospel is the case of that. So Galatians 3, 26 through 28, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And it shows joy in that passage in Acts 16 that we have in serving others. First Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. 
Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we don't live the radical nature of the gospel, we will be at war with one another and our relationships will fall apart. So my encouragement to us as a body is as we interact with each other, let's live this radical nature of the gospel that we see playing out in Acts 16 that are in these verses so that we can live in harmony and peace with one another as God intended from the beginning. I'm out of time, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And again, as I prayed at the beginning, may your spirit teach us, um, help us to see um, the specific ways that we contribute to conflict in the lives of those that are around us. We're all sinners. We all fail to do that. And sometimes our relationships are simply broken because the other people will just, are just simply not going to reciprocate. But may it be as much as possible within us that we be at peace with all men. And so may we see in our own lives where we need to be sanctified, where we can love one another, where we can forgive others, so that as much it be in us, we can be at peace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.